The town of Smithtown has a rich history of veterans that have served our country and fought for our freedom. The stories of these veterans should never be forgotten. It is important for us to recognize and pay tribute to these unsung heroes. Our new series does just that. In Faces of War, the American Veteran Experience, we will chronicle some of Smithtown's most heroic veterans. When I look back at the many men that sacrifice that they made, when I read my stories about uh, the different missions that these different people went on, not mine, the B-17 crews, and 14 planes would come back, and another day the 17 planes would come back, and another day 50 planes would come back, and I'm saying, they're all guys. They're all young men. How many are living? How many have survived? What sacrifices did they make? because they wanted freedom. James Dowling of Smithtown, New York is the epitome of the hard times of his generation, the heroics of ordinary men in extraordinary circumstances in the time of war, and the invaluable contributions of veterans to the development of post-war America. James Dowling is now 89 years old, the father of eight children and a proud grandfather and great-grandfather. He is the founder of Little League in his hometown, a retired highway superintendent and a collector and restorer of vintage Model A Fords. He has been featured in Tom Brokaw's best-selling book, The Greatest Generation. Brokaw went out into America to tell the stories of the greatest generation, heroes who came of age during the Great Depression and the Second World War and then went on to build modern America. Known fondly as Red due to his flaming red hair as a youth, he is a proud man that has served not only his country in war, but his community in countless ways. His service in World War II and his leadership in the town of Smithtown hide a life of struggle, adventure, heroism, and achievement. James Dowling's mother died when he was three months old and his father was unable to care for him and his sister and three brothers. Back in those days, social welfare was a matter of charitable people. The predicament of James and his siblings was announced in the church. I was three months old. Uh, my mother had, had passed away and my father had no way of taking because I had uh, a sister and three other brothers. But his brother, Pat Dowling, lived here on 50 Acre Road in St. James. And he came here and asked Pat, to, could he find someone to take care of this family? And uh, sure enough, on Sunday, Father Duke, who was in the Catholic Church here on the 25A, he announced that we had a three-month-old boy and a family that needed a governess, and they would be paid for that. So I came here, and this is 1923. In 1929, the Depression came, and my father, who was named John Dowling, he was driving a livery cab in the city. He lost his job. As many other people lost their jobs, he had no more funds to pay Mrs. Conklin to take care of us. So my two brothers went to New Jersey, and I stayed as an infant. Mrs. Conklin brought me up, and that's where my life started with the Conklin family. Well, I had a great time as a kid, even though it was through the Depression and it was a hard time for the Conklins to take care of us. We prevailed because they had a small farm with uh, pigs and chickens. My father used to go out all through the wooded area of Nescans and shoot rabbits. I lived all these many years in Nesconset, grew up in Nesconset. 
I went to St. Philip and James Catholic School. Then I went to Smithtown High. At about this time, the skies over Long Island were seeing more and more airplanes taking off from nearby Roosevelt Field, the same airport where Charles Lindbergh had taken off in the spirit of St. Louis and crossed the Atlantic in 1927. Dowling was intrigued by this comparably new field of aviation, and by his senior year in high school, war was rampaging in Europe. Of course, the war was going on in Europe in 1938-39. They were bombing England. We were staying out of the war. When I became a senior, uh, I had got injured in a football game, and my, uh, I went to Mesa Hospital, and they took a cartilage out of my right knee. And there on December 7th, uh, my knee was in a cast, hanging up, and the uh, Dr. Chavez came around and said, Redhead, they'll never take you. Well, little did, little did you know, one year later, Uncle Sam <laughs> said, we want you. Drafted in 1944 at the age of 19, he promised his hometown sweetheart, Dorothy Owen, that when he returned, they'd be married. He would soon be a long way from the innocence of his youth growing up on Long Island. The situation in America at that time, if you were 17, you could join the Navy, the Merchant Marine, uh, anywhere. But you, if you were 18 or 19, the government froze us. We, we had to wait until they decided where, where they wanted to put us. So I was finally uh, drafted into the Army and went out to Camp Upton on January 3rd, 1942. The area of central Suffolk County, presently occupied by Brookhaven National Laboratory, once served our nation in a different manner. It was the site of the U.S. Army's Camp Upton, which was active from 1917 until 1920, and again from 1940 until 1946. During World War II, the camp was rebuilt primarily as an induction center for draftees. The Army was to later use this site as a convalescent and rehabilitation hospital for returning wounded. I remember how cold it was out there and uh, with all these fellas from uh, Smithtown, and Kings Park and Hot Park, St. James, all of us went out there one group. So I was lucky I, I uh, won during the Air Force, so I applied right away. I had to take the physical and I was worried about that because of my knee. And sure enough, everything was fine until I got to the knee and they called the doctors in. And so finally they said, well, what we'll do, we'll pass him here because when he goes to the uh, Air Force for physical exercises, he's going to make it or he's not going to make it. James Dowling did make it. He was one of the select few chosen to train for the United States Air Force. Assigned to Big Springs, Texas, he began his aviation training in the Beechcraft AT-11. Right there, we used to fly in twin-engine planes with one pilot and two, two cadets. And one cadet would be in the nose working the bomb site, and the other cadet would be the co-pilot. And then when the first one dropped his five bombs, then the next fella came and you became the co-pilot. It was quite an experience. Uh, flying these AT-11s. The Army Air Force AT-11s were advanced twin-engine trainers that were used to train bombardiers, gunners, and navigators during World War II. Over 90% of all the bombardiers in World War II trained in this glass-nosed version of the famous Twin Beach. After his training in Big Springs, Dowling was assigned to Ellington Field in Houston, Texas to begin his cadet training. And that was a tremendous experience in my life because it was one year of cadet training similar to West Point training. It was all academic, English, uh, math, physics, exercising, learning how to march. I belonged to the Drill and Bugle Corps. And it was really an experience for a young man to have to become an officer. 
From there, I went to Pueblo, Colorado. Met my crew when we were assigned to B-24s. We flew it the whole summer in B-24s, learning how to bomb, shoot the 50 caliber guns. The Consolidated B-24 Liberator was an American heavy bomber designed by Consolidated Aircraft of San Diego, California. The B-24 was used in World War II by every branch of the American Armed Forces during the war. It was also used by several Allied forces and navies. Mass production was brought into full force by 1943 with the aid of the Ford Motor Company at its newly constructed Willow Run facility. Peak production had reached one B-24 per hour and 650 per month in 1944. It still holds the distinction as the most produced American military aircraft, often compared with the better known B-17 Flying Fortress. The B-24 was a more modern design with a higher top speed, greater range, and a heavier bomb load. However, it was also more difficult to fly. The placement of the B-24's fuel tanks throughout the upper fuselage made the aircraft vulnerable to battle damage. The B-24 was notorious among American air crews for its tendency to catch fire. Nevertheless, the B-24 provided excellent service in a variety of roles thanks to its large payload and long range. We had to learn how to operate and fly in the B-24. We had 10 men in a plane, two pilots, a navigator, an engineer, and a bombardier. The rest of the crew were all gunners. I was up in the front and either on a turret or I was on the bomb site and somebody else would be in a turret. But that's how we formed the crew. Every pilot usually named his plane or sometimes he let the crew name it. All this art was on all the planes. Our plane didn't have it yet, but we christened it Frigid Bridget. The practice of illustrating aircraft in colorful and imaginative designs was nothing new, and the B-24s were no exception among the 8th Air Force in carrying on a long-held tradition in painting all types of images on the ample canvas provided by the long nose section of the B-24. The examples range from a simple name to sophisticated illustrations that adorn most aircraft. The female form and names were a common favorite, while others displayed cartoon characters of the time and sometimes a witty comment. We had our pilot and he said, I'm gonna name my name after my girlfriend. Her name is Bridget. Okay, that's nice. We can see now Bridget, Irish girl, uh, in a figure with a bathing suit or whatever. No, he says, it's gonna be Frigid Bridget. We all looked at one another. Frigid Bridget? That's what I'm gonna name it. Oh my God. After about three months training, we were sent to Wichita, Kansas to pick up our airplane. And when we got there, uh, there weren't enough airplanes for all the crews, so they had a lotto system. My pilot, Ed Johnson, won. So we had a plane to fly over in Europe. We went to New Jersey with thousands of other men, and we came across the Atlantic on the Queen Elizabeth. The wonderful experience there, yeah, we also was with the Glen Miller Band. They had 18,000 troops, nurses, wax, airmen, soldiers, and we landed in Glasgow, Scotland. I went to the 445th Farm Group, and I was assigned to 703rd Squadron, which was the actor Jimmy Stewart's squadron. He had briefed some of the missions for us. He was quite a flyer, he flew 22 bombing missions before they decided to take them off and send them out to headquarters in the 8th Air Force.
They sent us to a big base in Northern Ireland. We were trained with the British system of navigation, which was far superior to what we had in the United States. Of course, the British were in the war five years by that time, and they had the best maps and the best navigation. We were learning how to use a G-box and things of that nature. I was graduated as a bombardier navigator, not just a bombardier. So I could navigate as well. And then finally, I made my first mission in the Strasbourg in France, which is right on the Rhine River. And I flew with a different crew, not with my crew at the time. And as we bombed our target, we pulled off and, and uh, 80 degree turn, and the Germans were shelling us in front of our noses at night. We were scared to death. And when I got back to the base, I asked the crew, that must have been a tough mission. And they, because they were kidding around with me, a little red-headed kid, <laughs> didn't know nothing, they said, no, oh, it was a milk run. Well, I was more scared. Now I said, that's a milk run, I'll never make it. But we uh, went to the officer's club uh, that evening, and uh, then they came over to me saying, Redhead, we want to tell you something. That was not a milk run. That was a tough mission. <laughs> so I was relieved, really, at that time. It was a scary time. No matter how many practice missions we had, when we got in our plane and the engine started up, that was quite a time because you're reflecting about your life, and your mother and father, and your brothers, and everything. And then we'd go down that runway. We had to realize that we had 8,000 pounds of explosives behind us. And we knew from other missions that some planes didn't make it. They didn't get off. And you would rumble down that runway for like two minutes with the engines roaring, and you would hope that not one of those engines would die out because you were not going to lift off that runway. But eventually, God willing, you did. You lifted off that runway and you went up. As a bombardier navigator, I was in charge of all the rest of the crew. All the enlisted men, I was in charge to make sure their guns were working, that they were in proper uniform. And during flying time, I had to check, make sure about every 10, 15 minutes that I would call them, make sure their oxygen masks were working because sometimes they would freeze up and they would pass out. So many things could happen to us. The plane itself, propellers would fly off some time and go right through the cockpit. Or the landing gears would, would not come down and people had to belly in. And we've seen that with 17s where they bellied in with their ball turrets still hanging underneath. It was uh, just a horrible thing. We were young. Inexperienced, just hopeful. They put that bombardier uh, flying wing on you. You thought you were the greatest in the world, but you really weren't. <laughs> it, was a, it was a real time. Uh, but I had uh, 11 missions. The average mission in, uh, the, uh, in Europe was six, and I have 11. 11 missions. At the time, Lieutenant Downey had no idea that his 11th mission would be involved in one of the highest group losses in the history of the 8th Air Force. The morning of September 27th, 1944, began like any other morning, a briefing to learn about what to expect on today's mission. In the briefing, we would find out everything about that mission, where we would go after we dropped our bombs. That was important too. We would find out what kind of escort we were going to have. Sometimes you'd have a P-47 escort. Other times you'd have P-38s. Of course, the best wouldn't have had the P-51s. And the P-51s were great. They stayed above us all the time. On September 27, 1944, was my 11th mission. And when my crew and I were briefed, we saw that it was Castle. It was building tanks. So we were trying to hit this tank factory, and that was the reason. It started out uneventfully with 39 planes scheduled to take off from the 445th Bomb Group. By the time they reached their destination, four B-24s had aborted, so eventually, 35 planes remained. 
the 445th was leading the second combat wing. The other groups in the wing were the 389th and the 453rd. The weather over Germany was not very good, with a thick cloud cover. They approached the target and were supposed to make a slight left turn in an east, southeasterly direction towards Kassel. But for some reason, the lead ship turned almost directly east. A mistake that would take them past the target city of Kassel, too far to the north. Unfortunately, we were turned by the lead pilot away from the Kassel mission. Of course, they couldn't see the target, which I picked up and I had it in my bomb site that I could see it. Even though it was nine tenths clouds, we would be skipping in between, but I could actually pick up the city. But we were overruled by a major. We were only lieutenants. And that's the system in the army. When it says, follow me, you follow me. Nearly every navigator in the 445th picked up the mistake almost instantly, but it was far too late for the lead ship to correct to the right. If they had, they would have run into a stream of bombers coming up from the rear. As the 445th veered to the left, the crew behind them wondered why they were leaving the intended target. To this day, that answer remains a mystery. The only explanation was that the radar man had made a grievous error, although Lieutenant Dowling still doesn't have the answer. We don't know that because that plane was blown up and crashed and they were all killed. So we never found out why. The bomb group behind me, they had it on radar. They picked it up. They actually bombed the target. The lead group, headed by Major Donald McCoy, decided to continue east and bomb the city of Gotenien, about 50 miles away. As a result, they lost their fighter escort and flew alone to their destiny. They found their target and dropped their bombs at Gotenien and then proceeded west. By this time, they were probably 100 miles behind the rest of the division. Then we were out beyond the secondary target without fighter escort. All the fighters were over the target looking for us, all P-51s. We were to the left some 15, 20 miles, and they couldn't find us. As they made their turn, they were attacked from the rear by between 100 and 150 German fighters. Most of these fighters were specially adapted FW-190s, equipped with extra armor and both 20 and 30 millimeter cannons. They were accompanied by a small number of ME-109s. The battle lasted only a few minutes, but it was a horrendous attack as the FW-190 assault fighters passed through the bomber formations with the 20 and 30 millimeter cannons blazing and the 50 caliber machine guns of the B-24s responding in defense. The skies were full of bright flashes from the exploding shells. The 109s attacked us from the front and they just kept on going and went past. But from the rear it was the 190s and they shot right underneath and us and destroyed planes are blowing up all over the place. And our plane, on the second pass, the number three engine on the right was shot right out of the wing. Uh, the tail gunner was, he had a, a plexiglass shield about that thick, was hit with a 20 millimeter, and the concussion blew him right out of his seat, and the guys put him back in so he kept on firing. But the next pass, the shots come up underneath us and blew our nose wheel right out from the plane. It was just instantaneous that you had the explosions within the, in the nose of the plane and, uh, and uh, confusion and, and the smoke. And, uh, and when you, all you heard was a bailout, bailout, uh, you were hoping that the bombardier who was uh, in the turret, he got out. You didn't have time to even, because you lost your oxygen. And if you stayed in there too long, you would be, without oxygen, you'd be dead or you wouldn't be able to pull your chute when, uh, pull your ripcord when you got down. So it was a, everybody went out. It was self-preservation at that time because when you were looking at other planes blowing up in the sky and the whole crew has gone, you only have seconds to save your own life. Bateman went out without a parachute. When his body went out. He was, I believe he was dead anyway. At least I hope he was. He, uh, was such a great 
navigator. His, his, he kept his chute down on the floor. And I would beg him, I said, Herb, please put that chute, one hook, something. But he didn't have it on that day. When he went out, I rolled out and fell from 24,000 feet to 6,000 before I pulled my chute. But there were planes falling through the sky. And then I was coming down into a potato field. As I was coming down, I saw two old men near a railroad crossing shack, and they were coming towards me. And I hollered, nine guns, nine guns. And when I landed, I got knocked unconscious. And I ended up in this little village when they were carrying me on their shoulders in. And I was all bloodied up. 300 guys bailed out, or 300 men were in those planes. 108 of them were killed, so we don't know how many didn't bail out, or blew up with the plane, or crashed with the plane with the whole crew in it. We don't know how many. But we do know that we lost 108 men in the air, and we lost eight men on the ground who were killed by civilians. For James Dowling, the war was essentially over. As soon as he hit the ground, he was captured by German soldiers and soon found himself on a train headed 300 miles north. The journey was often interrupted by attacks from American airplanes, unaware that the German trains were loaded with American POWs. The newspapers reported that Dowling was listed as missing in action. But soon, Dowling's family and sweetheart, Dorothy Owen, received a telegram notifying them that he was alive and well. After a harrowing journey, the train arrived in the seaside village of Barth, Germany. We're in this prison camp, which is called Starleglyph 1. Eventually, we're 9,700 Americans in, in that camp in four different compounds. As they come off the train in Barth, it was a little fishing town. And as they got to the prison camp, all these guys hanging on the fence, seeing these new prisoners, and they called us Kriegis. That was the German word for Kriegsgefangelen, the prisoner of war. So we called each other Kriegis. But when I'm walking in there, all these guys hanging on the fence saying, hey, Red, hey, Red. They all knew me from school. Because I was only called, nobody knew my name was Jim. Everybody they called me Red, but that was quite a warming feeling. They all know me, and, and uh, maybe things will be all right. In prison camp, uh, we were assigned to our barracks, and each barracks had about 180, 190 guys in different compartments, and that's where you stayed, 16 men to a room. You had your bed bunks, which were made out of crude wood, with a straw mattress. The Air Force was very fortunate that Goring was a hero in World War I. He was an ace, and he became the head of the German Luftwaffe. He treated the American airmen as they would treat themselves. The Luftwaffe did the best they could to allow us to uh, uh, be in a, a decent camp, uh, all, all barracks with tar paper type of barracks. But uh, the food that we got was from the International Red Cross that came from Sweden or Switzerland. They had volunteers in Sweden who was neutral, who would come over to Germany and drive trucks, bringing food to each and every one of these camps called the Red Cross parcel. And in those parcels, you had enough to subsist for a week with powdered egg, powdered milk, a chocolate bar, biscuits, two packs of cigarettes, things of that nature. That was decent that we could subsist with that. But after the Battle of the Bulge, when the Americans were marching into Germany and the Air Force was shooting up everything that moved, these volunteers couldn't drive through Germany. They couldn't come out of Switzerland and go into the camps. It wasn't just the Air Force, the Army too, they were the camps they were servicing. You ended up eating the food that was left in the warehouses.
Prison life was uh, is the way you wanted to handle it. Some guys handle it differently. I had a thing about life, it was great, and I could handle anything, I guess. James Dowling would have to handle life in Stalag Luft One for the next eight months. As the new year began, the end was near for Hitler and the Third Reich. Prisoner of war Lieutenant James Dowling was liberated by advancing Russian troops in May 1945. The Russians liberated us and uh, we were all happy about that. 14 August 1945, VJ Day. The Second World War at last is over. World War II was finally over, but tensions were building between Russia and the Allies, and the fate of the POWs was uncertain until the 8th Air Force flew into Barth and rescued the POWs in a massive airlift called Operation Revival. The Russians had liberated the camp on May 1st, but Dowling had to wait nearly two weeks before he and the approximately 9,000 prisoners of war at Stalag Luft One were flown out of Barth, Germany and back into Allied control. The American POWs were flown to Camp Lucky Strike in Lavra, France, where they were processed and waited for a liberty ship to return to the United States. At the end of the war, this American jeep came in to our prison camp with two army sergeants. Uh, and they wanted to tell us that we were going to be freed and we were going to be flying home with B-17s. Well, I found a scrap of paper. It was like a paper bag. And I wrote a letter to Dorothy, my girlfriend. I folded it up and gave it to the sergeant. And I said to him, do you think you can send this home to America? Yes, Lieutenant, I think I can. Well, off they went. Little did I know what would happen to that, right? When I got home, I found out it did happen. And we still have it. And uh, in that letter, I said, you know, we were going together in high school. And uh, I said, when I get home, we're going to get married. Eventually, I got home. With a purple heart in hand, James Dowling came home and married Dorothy Owen. He stayed in the service for another two years. He had hoped to become a jet pilot, but when Dorothy became pregnant with their second child, he decided it was time to return home to Smithtown. I had sold my car out in California at a great price because all the GAs that were coming home, there were no cars in California. They got tripled what I should have gotten here. And I used that money to start my business. I bought a truck and I went into the seafood business with my father. It became a thriving business and with his afternoons free, he started organizing baseball games for the kids in the neighborhood, including his five sons. With the baby boom of the 1950s, each year saw more and more kids playing the national pastime in the town of Smithtown. I was the coach the umpire and the supplier. And we had great times, and the kids still talk about the great times that we had. One day, this group of fellows came to me and said, Reverend, we understand you have a bunch of boys playing ball. I said, yeah, they are. You ever hear of Little League? I said, no, I never heard of Little League. He said, first thing I said to him, do all the kids play? Oh yeah, all the kids play. He said, we'd like you to form with us the Little League, and your kids would be part of it. That's again, I said, are all the kids going to play? Yeah, oh yeah, yes, yes. And all the kids did play. By the 1970s, there were over 600 boys playing in the Little League in the town of Smithtown. Red Dowling would go on to be president of the league for 18 years. His service to the community was not just relegated to Little League, and in the early 1960s, another veteran, the town clerk, asked him to run for superintendent of highways in Smithtown. They felt his experience with heavy equipment made him the perfect candidate, and the next question took Dowling by surprise. Well, they'd like you to run. Really? 
oh yeah, we think that you have any experience to run. I said to him, well, when do you have to know? He said, by eight o'clock tonight. Well, I said, I gotta go home and talk to my wife. I said, this is a big decision to make. So I went home to talk to Donnie. She said, honey, whatever you wanna do, sounds good to me. So I started out and I had a sign printed up, Jim Dowling running for highway superintendent. And pretty soon I got the word, nobody knows who Jim Dowling is. All my classes, all my classmates, your name is Red. We don't know who the heck Jim Dowling is. I had to pull all those signs down, it wasn't too many of them yet, and had to reprint it. James Red Dowling, highway superintendent. And I told him how I was going to improve all the roads in the town of Smithtown. We're going to make permanent roads, no more oil and sand. Sure enough, when the election came, I won by 1,200 votes. Much a surprise to everyone. <laughs> and I decided right then and there, this is going to be run as the Air Force. And I started laying rules and regulations down and never heard of before. I had a lot of my Little League friends, I had a lot of clam leaders, knowing they're going to be good workers. And that's what I did. I surrounded myself with good, hard-working men and made good foremen, and we had a program. Ninety percent of a job is that you like to job you have. And if you love to come to work, that's important. And, uh, and I try to to hold that standard. Dowling's techniques in the highway department became the standard that many towns would ultimately follow. He was especially proud of his snow removal innovations and viewed a snowstorm as a war against Mother Nature, much like the battles he had with the Luftwaffe during World War II. He introduced modern snow tires and new hydraulic systems that allowed the crew to plow and run the spreader simultaneously. He was a big advocate of early preparedness, something that was unheard of during that time. I keep telling people, it wasn't Jim Dowling that plowed those roads. It was my crew. They were a great crew. They, they really appreciated what I did for them, and I appreciated what they did for me. And that was the benefit to the town of Smithtown. And then besides that, we started to build the road system. I'm proud to say I built 250 miles of road in the town of Smithtown, from the oil and sand roads that they were to what we have today. James Red Dowling retired after 38 years of service in the Smithtown Highway Department. His wife, Dorothy, passed away in 2011 after 64 years of marriage. He remains active in the community and now devotes much of his time to his passion, restoring antique Model A Fords. I've been building cars now for 40 years. I'd sell one to get enough money to buy another one. Well, you really didn't make any money because if you got paid, it was like $5 an hour. With all the time that you put in to build them, it was a labor of love. And the wonderful thing about it, the people that you sold them to were so appreciative of them. And I have uh, right now four online. I have two Woodies, a Huckster, a fire truck that are running, and they're licensed and are running. And it's a great show for my grandkids for me to ride around with them. James Dowling is proud of his family and his personal independence. He can look back on a life filled with struggle, heroism, adventure, and achievement. Through it all, he remains humble and thankful for the remarkable journey that life has given him. Yeah, I was very lucky. I've been lucky all my life. You know, lucky to, as an orphan to find a wonderful family that brought me up. Lucky to be going through the war and uh, surviving. We had a wonderful family. We still have a wonderful family with that many grandkids and, and so many wonderful times that we've had. I was an adventurous guy and they shared my adventures. Every generation has its share of men who fully live the art of courage. 
these were men that grew up during the Great Depression. They were men who went off to fight in the war to end all wars. They knew the meaning of sacrifice. They were humble men who never bragged about what they had done or what they had been through. They were loyal, patriotic, and level-headed. A sense of personal responsibility and a commitment to honesty is their greatest attribute. And to quote Tom Brokaw, it is, I believe, the greatest generation any society has ever produced.